What's up guys? Nate and Sutton back with another video and today we have a very special guest. Most of you already know me. I'm Mike Winger, a pastor in Southern California. I like to answer hard questions about Christianity, but this is Nate and Sutton. They're Christian vloggers who recently interviewed me on their YouTube channel. They actually gave me a bunch of difficult questions, pretty hard questions that they got from their audience. And I've got timestamps down below in this video to specific spots and questions, and you could find exactly what you want. Just check it out there. There's also some other links down there below, including a link to Nate and Sutton's channel. If you think you may be interested in their content, I sure am. All right, enjoy. This is, this is someone who we personally listen to a lot and is kind of like our go to uh, when it comes to questions around faith and you know our Christianity and questions difficult questions that you guys throw at us a lot of the time so um, a lot of times you'll, you'll ask us questions and we'll be like let's go see what Mike Winder has to say <laughs> <laughs> now and you're then, getting the source directly because he's here today and he's answering your questions that you guys gave us on Instagram yeah yeah so I, I would consider Mike someone that out of all the Christian um, figures out there and uh, influencers, I probably respect his opinion on a topic more than uh, any other person I listen to. You know, uh, so I really am excited to have Mike on the call today. So welcome to our channel, Mike. Hey, it's really good to be with you guys. What what little I've I've had a chance to get to know you just a bit, and uh, I'm I'm excited to be here with you. And and I just want to give the caveat, which is to let everybody else know what you know already about me, which is I definitely don't know everything. <laughs> I just give my best answers. Uh, not always the best answer. I just do my best. You know, I try to study these things a lot. I care a lot about that, but I also know my human limitations and, and I know that it's the word of God. That's the truth. And I'm, I'm here just a normal human trying to figure it out and share it with others. So, um, so yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's one of the things I love so much about when I listen to your videos, it seems you seem to come from such a grounded approach. And just like when I listen to you, I, I feel like I walk away with more knowledge than before where a lot of times I hear speakers and they sound really intelligent, but I walk away from the videos and I'm just like, I don't know how much of that I actually soaked in, but when I listen to your content, it's just like, wow, I feel like I just became way more knowledgeable on got this. got wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, praise God. That's awesome to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're really excited. We asked our viewers, we asked you guys uh, some of the toughest questions revolving Christianity and faith. And, um, and we were going to throw them at you today, Mike, if that's okay. Yep. Yeah, I'll do my best. There's, these are some tough questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we jump in, I'm just like, do you do you consider do you like research like unprecedented amounts, or does this knowledge just come naturally, or how would you how would you say? Yeah. Like, um, the the only thing that that I yeah I I do research a lot. Um, not probably more than anybody else, but the truth is that even when I'm <clears throat> on staff, when I was on staff uh, as a high school pastor, I would like study side issues and I'm sitting there thinking I'm never even going to teach this I'm just studying it because I just want to know you know and so I, I just kept piling in all this information just kept chasing all these rabbits you know about God about Jesus about different religions about tough questions and there I am like on Yahoo answers you know trying to back in the day trying to like give people answers to their challenging questions and stuff anyway long story short uh now that I'm time doing this I'm I little I literally can study for 30 hours for one Bible study and, and I I love that so I it's okay for me to do that I could do this on a weekly basis I can take a topic and just chase it down I you know I did a, a study on the topic of uh, divorce and remarriage and I I put over 200 hours of, of research into that um, and that's very exciting because then I get to feel really grounded about the answers and then I summarize it in a way that I, I go because you know what you do is you read a whole book and you go, I read the whole book for, for these two ideas. And then I just share those two ideas with people and not necessarily the entire process. But but yeah, so um, I'm not the smartest Christian, but uh, but maybe I feel like I kind of, to be honest, and this might sound like I'm patting myself on it, but I'm just trying to understand myself and know where I fit in the body of Christ. I think I fit somewhere in between the average person and the scholar so that you know, scholars, they learn all this stuff, but then they they sometimes aren't good at sharing it with others. <laughs> and, and the average person's like, I know I have these convictions, right? But I don't have the time to dig into all those issues and go really deep on everything. And so I try to find that middle ground where I just talk to normal people, but from a place of having tried to access 
the best information I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like you're the epitome of why we created our channel is because one day, you know, me and Sutton were like, well, we have this gift of videography and we have a message that we'd like to share with the world. And YouTube seems like um, such an amazing outlet for it. Oh, yeah. And we posted a video and it got like 500 views, you know, and we we're like 500 people saw that video. And that's then, right. And then I, and I see you're, you're what you're doing. And I just, I feel like the impact that you probably have on the world is so large that it's it's just amazing so I, I just love what you're doing yeah well praise god for his grace because i'm just a knucklehead in, in california I'm, I'm amazed i'm just constantly amazed the size of the channel and the growth of the content is such now that i'm just it's like if it shrunk by like 90 percent, i'd still be happy <laughs> i'd still be more than content it just blows me away just blows me away yeah all right here we go get your smart pants on <laughs> Okay. So, okay. So what are your thoughts on divorce and remarriage as a Christian? And if it's biblical, and I know you at the beginning, you just said you did a whole thing about this with all this time spent. So maybe you want to direct one to that video, or you could just give a short answer here and then direct them to the video. Yeah, I'll give a short answer, but it, it is a three hour long video and it's not for everybody. I fully admit that, but there are some people who go, man, I want to honor God with my life, but I'm going through some really hard stuff and I need some help answering a lot of tough questions, that's what that video is for. I go through tons of scripture, historical analysis, linguistic analysis, but on a level people can follow. Um, but let me give you some of my conclusions that I think we can stand on, right? Which is uh, first, marriage is sacred, right? We should seek to keep marriages. And this is so key. This is something, as a counselor, this is like the number one thing I try to try to get couples to realize, individuals to realize, is that we should unilaterally fulfill our calling to serve Christ through being a good spouse and being gracious and forgiving and loving. And I say unilaterally, because that means like, Nate, if, if Sutton's not doing it, you still have to do it. Like as a Christian, you don't use their failures to excuse your misbehavior or bad attitudes. And that is probably the hardest part for me. I mean, I'm married, we've been married for 11 years. And it's always when I feel I'm mistreated that I start to mistreat. And so as Christians, yeah, like I, I have to just say, okay, this is, I just got to die to myself and honor God unilaterally. No Christian's going to think clearly about their marriage. And if, if anybody's listening, you're struggling with your marriage, you will not, you, like you're thinking foggy right now, unless you've really given over your being a spouse, your husband or wife, you've given that over to the Lordship of Christ in your marriage. If this is about serving Christ and not just fulfilling your needs, now you can start to think clearly. And until you get that going, it won't happen. Um, I would say also scripture indicates that unjustified, and I'm gonna use that word carefully, unjustified divorce is morally wrong. And it doesn't remove our obligation to just get back together as soon as possible. So wrongly divorcing, guess what? You're still tied together morally. God wants you to restore that marriage. He still wants you to get back together. I would say remarriage, if you marry somebody after, divorce wrongly, it's a wrong divorce, and then you remarry. That was a wrong thing. You shouldn't have done that. But now you did it. Like this is now your marriage. You need to be faithful to this. You need to honor God in this. And that that marriage constitutes like an adulterous moment that finally broke the first marriage. So now you need to serve God and move forward. And this is a sanctified and holy marriage now. Like like don't just ruin the second one. You know, like go forward and honor God with it. Um, I would say that there are justifications for divorce and remarriage, like divorce and remarriage to somebody else. And that would be adultery, like a, a serious, very, very serious sexual sin. You don't have to get divorced if someone commits adultery, but that is, a, Jesus talks about that as a justification. Or a partner uh, who chooses to leave you and they will not submit to Christ or the church, like through repeated attempts for reconciliation and restoration. They won't listen to the church. They won't listen to, to the teachings of Jesus. They, they reject you. They're abandoning you. And, and your heart's open. Your heart's trying to seek restoration. Like there's a point at which you go, okay, I'm letting them go now. And that's, I, I, did, I do teach through the scripture on this, 1 Corinthians 7 and all that. And um, I'd also say anything that's like crazy situations, we need to be seriously, like it's extreme abuse. A man's like beating and beating and beating his wife and his kids on like, you can flee that person. You can divorce that person if necessary. My fear is that Sometimes after someone becomes embittered, all of a sudden, their past that they never thought was abuse, like extreme abuse, they start talking as if it was, right? And so then they start to, but I was emotionally abused. And 
like there is extreme emotional abuse. Like I was a domestic violence counselor for years. So there is like legitimate extreme emotional abuse. And I, there's no excuse for that. And you should, you should, you know, get yourself to safety if that's you. But a lot of times I've heard people sort of magnify how bad the marriage was to try to justify where their heart is now. I just want a divorce. And so there's a, da a danger for us there. Um, things that do not justify a divorce. I'm bitter. I'm not happy. We've grown apart. I hate them. I found happiness with someone else. Or maybe I found happiness alone. I don't care anymore. I got married too young. It's like, no, nope, suck it up. Stay married. <laughs> go go, uh, go honor the Lord in this. And this is not our popular culture. I think this is what biblical teaching is is giving us though. And um, I go through it in great detail in that in the video. I will, uh, I'll send you guys a link to it if you're interested. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, all of these questions that we're asking, Mike, I know he, he does really in-depth videos on his channel. And Mike, you can feel free to plug those at any given point if you're like, yeah, I did a three-hour video on this, but here's the short answer. So for this purpose of this video, we're trying to get as much meat and potatoes as we can with all these questions. But to dive really deep, uh, Mike does a lot of really amazing content on his channel. So... Um, yeah, speaking of kind of like going off that question, I know that one of them was you said something about like fleeing a relationship. And I know one of the questions was, you know, God calls us to forgive 70 times seven or whatever. And when is it okay to be like, I'm done? I'm done trying to like make this work, whether it be a marriage or a friendship or with your parents or whoever. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think something that helps me here a lot with this question and, and it, it clicked when I thought of this or had someone else share it with me actually was the difference between forgiveness um, and restoration. Or perhaps one way to say it is the difference between forgiveness offered and forgiveness received and a relationship being healed. And these are not all the same things. So uh, scripture tells us in Ephesians that we should forgive others even as God in Christ forgave us. That's really interesting. I don't think think people notice that there's a qualifier for how we should forgive the same way that God in Christ forgave us. So in Christ, God has a certain posture towards us. Like uh, I had one old teacher who used to call it the cross posture. He goes on the cross, Jesus's arms are wide open. And this is just, you know, an allegory for the idea that he's like saying, I'm welcoming you. My arms are open, but Jesus still requires them to turn from their sin, to come to Christ. Like there's an attitude change about a life of sin. Like I don't, Lord, I want you as my Lord. I don't just want your forgiveness. I want you. I want relationship with you and you're holy. And I want that in my life. And so um, as a Christian, I think that my attitude is, is that of Christ where I go, in my heart, forgiveness is fully like set and ready to go. But if they're ongoing in their behaviors, there is no restoration of relationship. And if, does that make sense? Like, okay, I'm ready to forgive that person. They were abusive to me. They took advantage of me in the past. Let's say you had a business partner that embezzled and lied to you. And then later they're like, hey, let's do another business together. And you could be like, you know, you've never even really repented of the past. Like, I, I'm ready. I'm not bitter. I'm totally ready to forgive you. But this, that doesn't mean we're restored. Right? Because you're, you're still ongoing with the same behaviors. And so then the next step would be to say, um, and there's wisdom here, right? Like God doesn't want us to be fools. So it's it's great to be forgiving to people like, and to say, I forgive you, but at the same time to be like, but I'm not gonna let you borrow my car right now. Like that would be foolish. I'm not gonna start a second business with you after the last time you embezzled and caused all these problems. So yeah, I think that we forgive the way that God forgives us. In my heart, there's no bitterness, but that doesn't mean that restoration's automatic. And that hopefully keeps us from being in these ongoing abusive, situations. Um, although where I think the world takes it too far is they turn it into like, you got to do what's right for you. You got, you got to take care of yourself. There's a certain place there where it becomes like a pride thing and a selfish thing. And we're excusing our selfishness. I think as Christians, we have to think of it as a wisdom thing. I forgive them. It's just not wise to get into that again. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys think about that? Man, I, I love that analogy uh or well, i guess it's not even an analogy i guess it's scripture what you're saying is uh forgive how christ forgave you and meaning like forgiveness is not necessarily automatic but it's uh it's like i'm here to forgive you like let's let's do this but if, if they're not willing to restore then there isn't or come to restore there isn't forgiveness there is that kind of what you're saying 
Yeah, exactly. So I've dealt with my bitterness, but I haven't fixed your issues. <laughs> right. And I guess yeah. I've never viewed it really like that. How, you know, I mean, that's, that's how it works with us in Christ is like, you know, we are forgiven as long as we ask for forgiveness. Right. I mean, is that, is that how you would? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, 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 we say yes, we say yes, God. And there's conditions he has that it doesn't involve us doing any works, but it involves our attitudes changing about our sin. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I mean, I thought that was great. <laughs> I was just like, wow. just continued to be mindful. And I'm like, is anyone else right. hearing this? <laughs> this is good stuff. Um, yeah, so, uh, what is this? Five. Okay, so switching gears here a little bit. A lot. What are your thoughts on the COVID vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm not a medical guy, and I, I haven't even spent the time researching it, okay? So I can't, like, comment on what to me look like conspiracy theories. Okay, I could be wrong. I'm just saying they look like conspiracy theories. Maybe they're not. Um, I know there's some people who I normally would respect, and they're like, dude, this is a problem. So maybe they're right there. All I'm going to say is this. Pastorally, as a guy that studies the Bible, cares about Scripture, as a guy who believes in, that the second coming is future, that there's a, there's a tribulation period. I, I do think those things are real. I'm going to say the COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast. That's the only thing I want to say <laughs> is it's not the mark of the beast. And if people think, but it could lead to the mark of the beast, then I'm just going to say, stop. Jesus didn't tell you to watch out for things that might lead to the things that might lead, that could cause, that could be the snowball effect of the... It's just, we look weird. When we do this stuff, we do. And, and there's whole Christian YouTube, Christian YouTube channels that like their whole thing is just sensationalizing end times prophecy and making weird connections to modern events that I, uh, just gets me. I, I talk about that a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just gonna say, I just don't think it's the mark of the beast. That's all I've got to say. And if someone wants to take the vaccine, now if they have questions about say, um, uh, it being related to like a, abortion and, you know, um, uh, what are the what are the cells called? The um, there's specific se cells that came from aborted babies. Um, I totally space. I can't remember the name. Of, yeah, I don't know the name of it. But. Anyway, there was like aborted babies in the past, in like I don't know the 80s or something like that, and they keep using those same cells. And if they go, I have a moral problem with it. Look, I'm not going to argue with you there. Okay, I'm just saying, don't call it the mark of the beast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's reassuring because I've questioned. I'm like, is this this is getting kind of weird. Um, and I agree. Not, I agree. Not it's a little weird. Yeah. Do you? I, I don't know the rules in California. Um, do you personally wear a mask uh, in public at places that aren't necessarily you have to wear a mask at? I wear I wear seven masks. I wear one <laughs> over my eyes too. And um, no, I, I I do wear a mask. Yeah, I wear. A, so I pretty much wear a mask wherever it's expected of me. And at first it was. I really hated it because the mask I had, like, I couldn't breathe. I don't know what mask I got. It was like, I'm like, I can't get oxygen. So I'm like, you know, trying <laughs> to breathe. And then we, we found one that it's like no trouble at all. So I, I, uh, I don't care. It doesn't really bother me that much. And I think that uh, if you're going to ask my, I, I hate to have an opinion about things people are angry about here, but, <laughs> but uh, if you're asking me, I would say, Masks seem like they have some measurable effect on the transmission of different things. Okay, I'm not like not like they're a cure, but but more importantly than that to me personally is that I'm encountering people all the time, and if I'm wearing this thing, it's not a stumbling block to them. But if I'm not wearing it, even though there's this expectation, especially in California, then it's a stumbling block to them. And I just I'm like, it's not that inconvenient for me. I don't care. I'm just gonna wear this thing. I, I actually have encountered some people who judge me for wearing a mask the way others would judge me if I didn't. And that, that kind of concerns me as a Christian. I'm like, these seem like secondary issues. I just don't want to divide on that stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally have a hard time wearing a mask, even in places where it's like mask required. And I don't know if it's like coming from a place of rebellion or it's like sometimes I genuinely feel like it's unhealthy for me, like to be breathing in my own carbon dioxide, you know? And I, I tell myself that wearing a mask is actually uh, more harmful than it is beneficial. And I, that I may be completely wrong and I'm open to that, but that's something that I personally struggle with is like, I, I'm definitely angry about the whole thing. And I, I don't know if I'm wearing, if I'm not wearing it because of that, or if it's just like, I think this is not the right. Yeah, I got to admit, 
Nate, I don't, I don't know the right answers to these questions. I really don't. No. <laughs> uh, probably I'm looking at it like, like pastorally and going, you know what? If I had a room of people and some of them were drinkers and some were not drinkers, I'd be like, let's not have drinking here so that we can all fellowship together and it won't cause problems. And I'm kind of like, I, so I would default to what I call like the weaker conscience or the person who has the more strict conscience for their sake. I think that's what Romans 14 tells us. And so if I look at masks in that, in that vein, I go, okay, I'm going to wear this thing, even if it's just to like appeal to the person who has the more strict conscience about these issues. But I, but at the same time, like you know, if someone walks up to me, they're not wearing a mask and they're like, I'm not wearing a mask. Is that okay? I just tell them I don't care because I just care more about the relationship with the person than stuff. But maybe, maybe that's, maybe I've just got the wrong answer there. I don't know. That's, that's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I definitely consider myself like a strict rule follower. Like I always, I, I even question if breaking the speed limit is like sinful. Um, but something about the mask is like, <laughs> it's like, man, I can't, I can't do it. Um, speaking of rules, do you, what do you think about that? Abiding by government, um, laws, rules, th even things such as little as like breaking the speed limit compared to, yeah. like, you know. When I was younger, I thought if you, if I broke the speed limit, I was I was sinning, and it's just like there's a law, you're breaking it. Like it just seemed like really simple to me. Um, but then I also realized there's a difference between the letter. <laughs> I'm going to sound sketchy here. I know it's going to sound sketchy to some people, but I think there's a difference between the the letter of the law and and what we understand it means. And so. Um, like if, if, if cops enforcing the law are like, if you go three miles over the speed limit, we don't care. Like if they're saying that, then I go, okay, well maybe it's the letters there, but the, but the strictness isn't quite as strict. So I tend to think that about that issue. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, you can't, <clears throat> you can't go out of the carpool lane, California, right? You can't go out of carpool lane because it's got that double solid yellow. <laughs> And, and I do obey that. Like I have like driven like miles out of the way because I got stuck in the carpool lane and I'm like, mm, I can't break the solid yellow because I don't feel like that's very flexible. I think that's just the way it is. But if there's a car accident in front of me and the lane is stopped, I'm probably going to go ahead and break that. And I think if a cop was right behind me, they would be like, come on, get out of the lane. Keep going. We got to keep traffic moving. So I... I think that there's something to that. I think that if you're driving the speed limit, you're say you're going 55 and everyone's going 68, um, and you're you could actually cause a, a traffic problem. Like that could be potentially dangerous because you sh there is a principle about keeping up with traffic. So, so I'm a little more flexible on that now. <laughs> yeah. Cool. He's getting into his own personal life now. <laughs> with these questions. <laughs> Okay, this was actually asked a lot of what do you think of women in positions of Christian leadership? <clears throat> this is one of the most common questions I get that I don't answer very well. Um, the truth is that, okay, I, I I think, and I'm going to really preface this, This some, some answers I feel much more confident. My talks on divorce and remarriage, I did all the homework. I think I'm very confident about my answers there. <clears throat> women in ministry, I think that... Um, the the role the one role of pastor like like senior pastor type role right there's different pa like if someone goes I'm the children's pastor I go okay well I wouldn't have a problem with that but but like kind of like the pastor for adults for adults and men in particular I don't think that that's something God has for women I think that's not something He has planned there as, as I understand Scripture okay all that being said women can still prophesy women can still speak in church it's not like it's not like the whole women are silent thing is not meant to be taken that strictly. But this is an issue where I really haven't vetted my own views very well here. And I have to acknowledge that. So I'm in the middle of teaching the Mark series. We're going through the gospel of Mark. When that's done, I'm going to stop and do a research project on the topic of women in ministry. And I'm going to try to come down to all the nitty gritty issues. I've got like several books here written by like people who have different views than me. They're like sitting in my little quick bookshelf I got. And I'm going to read through them and I'm going to study all the issues and then try to come up with, I hope, God willing, real clarity and real solid ground because it's a question I get asked all the time and I feel a little bit, I feel a little bit weak on how much work I've done to understand it well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I might change my mind and I might not and we'll see. Well, one question I definitely, I'm not sure, I think it's on here about uh, living in prosperity, like, you know, 
Jesus talking about giving, sell all your possessions, give them away. Like, what's your perspective on like us living in this house? Is this like, are we considered the rich? I mean, out of the world, I feel like, you know, we definitely are considered one of the richest percent percentiles. So how do you know, I mean, it might come back to the heart thing, but I am curious your perspective on uh, riches and having possessions and all of that. Um, well, I'll throw a few things at you. I, I think it's an individual issue not a corporate issue. I don't think there's a rule for Christians on how much money they can have. I think that um, the Christian church involves the rich and the poor. Just acknowledging that reality means that you it's hard to like sort of put a cap on how little or how much a Christian can have. But let me give you some examples of, of different types of people we see in the Bible. So there's this like rich young ruler that we read about and Jesus tells him, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Now, some think, okay, so I should sell all I have and give it to the poor. Except Jesus didn't tell most people that. He just told this one guy that. Hmm, why? Because that guy needed that. That that guy needed that. And I would just kind of say like, yeah, if you need to do that, do that. You know, <laughs> That's, Or if you just want to, go ahead and do that. But don't tell the whole church to do it. Because what's going to happen is we're going to be a super generous church for about two weeks. And then we're all going to be out with our hands out. right? Because now we're all poor. Like, Nate, you and Sutton are going to be super generous and you're going to give away all that you own and then you're going to be on the street begging. Now, multiply that by every Christian in your community. That is not a good look for the church. <laughs> like, you know, we, we don't want to just be a bunch of people asking for money. This is not like how we want to... And how then are we going to be generous and give if we don't have anything left because we've given everything away? So there's places for the, the poor in the body of Christ. The You know, poverty should not limit your involvement. But there's also places for the rich. Like Jesus' own ministry was supported, according to Luke, by these women who were well off. They were wealthy women. And they traveled and supported him financially. So they didn't sell all they owned, right? They it seems like they had ongoing income streams and they used that to support his ministry. Paul the Apostle was supported by people too. We read about one lady. Her name is Lydia. And Lydia, in the book of Acts, she's a seller of purple. Uh, now, purple was like an expensive clothing to get. Just getting pr the color purple was difficult back then. It was it was just very costly. And the um, this is why purple is associated with royalty. And so the uh, the woman, she's a seller of purple, which means she's like, she's like high-end clothing sales is what she does. And she actually supports other ministries out of her funds. In fact, she actually houses a church. Let me just say this. Every Christian gathering was in a home back then. All the Christians were gathering in homes, but they weren't just random homes. They were whatever person in the congregation had a big old house, right? They gathered in the wealthy Christians' homes. And so what I think we've got going on here is an example of a variety of wealth levels in the body of Christ and how we all just contribute in different ways. So if, if you were to sell all the homes, sell all the values, valuables in the early church, there would have been no local home fellowships. Where are they gathering? So yeah, there, there's a there's a variety of things to do. Um, if God lays it on your heart to sell all you have, go ahead and sell it. Uh, if not, then don't and be generous and serve God. Some people are called to be business leaders and to be wealthy and honor God with wealth. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I really like that answer. It seems like the more I personally study Scripture, it seems like the more it, it's in, it's vital to when Jesus was speaking to certain people, paying attention like who he was speaking to. Not necessarily it doesn't. Not that it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, or that it does, uh, or that it doesn't, but it just seems like an important thing to remember. Like sometimes he's speaking to certain people. No, I, I totally. Agree. It's dangerous to take what Jesus says to any random person and just go do it. <laughs> like he he sends the disciples go out into all the cities of Israel. I got all right, babe. We're going on a trip. You know, <laughs> it's like now we have billions of people all going to Israel at the same time. Yeah. A really very commonly asked question that I feel like it's a hard one to answer, but people wanted to know how to share the gospel to gay friends. And then also if you believe there is such a thing as like a gay Christian that continues to act on their temptations, but they call themselves a Christian. Okay, so uh, part, partly I just want to say we share the gospel with a gay friend the same way you share the gospel with anybody. Um, it's not like gay people are dealing with a different set of issues like we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. So like we all have our sin baggage and we all need to take that baggage to Jesus. Uh, so in a sense, you could, 
I might sound like, well, Mike, you're just kind of being kind of dumb here, but no, I, I actually think it's pretty simple. You just tell them like, like you got sin, Jesus got cross, like he takes sin to cross, Jesus takes sin to grave, Jesus rise, you believe, you live forever. You know, I mean, it's pretty basic, just gospel presentation there. Okay, so there's another issue uh, related to this, though, that makes it, that does make it hard to talk about and complicated. I want to acknowledge that. And that is um, our culture, it, it talks about gay or homosexuality as though it's an identity. And scripture, and I think the Christian worldview, talks about it like it's a habitual behavior. And so when you talk about it like it's a behavior, it's not like that big of a deal. You're like, oh, it's just on a big laundry list of things you don't want to be doing, right? Like, but the the world talks about it like it's an identity, like you're discovering your true nature. This is who you are, which is a strange thing. It's it's foreign to the Christian worldview to think that your your sexual desires identify like your true self. Um, and it is a dangerous thing for people to think this too. Uh, from the Christian worldview, I think I think we need to let people know this and remind them that there's tons of desires you've got that are just bad, that are just overblown, out of proportion, aimed at the wrong things. There's tons of desires. There's so many things that we have to deny that we want that Jesus just says, die to yourself. <laughs> like that's a pretty, like it's a pretty harsh statement when you think about it. Like you're going to die to yourself. You're going to take up your cross and it's going to be a self death um, you, or to put off that old nature and that kind of thing. So these are, these are Christian terms. So when scripture says things like, uh, homosexuals along with thieves and greedy and drunkards and idolaters and adulterers and anybody who's sexually immoral, that they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. When it says this, what it's, what it's saying is people who are living in practicing those habits, it's not talking about identities. The identity language is foreign to scripture. It's not talking about that. So if someone goes, I'm tempted with homosexual, uh, you know, desires. Therefore, I consider myself homosexual. Then I'll go, well, then there's tons of gay Christians because there's tons of Christians that have those desires. But are you living that lifestyle? That's when that's what the scripture is talking about. So I know some Christians who will say, I'm sure I'm, I'm gay, like that I have these desires, but I'm not engaging in them. And therefore, I'm, I'm considering myself a Christian. Others want to say I'm a gay Christian and they use the term in, in a different sense. They mean I'm gay and this is my lifestyle and I'm going to engage in these behaviors. And in that, I would say, if the person said I'm a drunkard Christian or I'm a sexually immoral Christian, I'm an adulterer Christian, I, I'm a thief Christian, I would say that's inconsistent with Christian commitments because Jesus is Lord. It means he's Lord. Like it means he's, he's, he's in charge of my life. So yeah, um, the, the thing that makes it really hard is that these other areas, adultery, drunkenness, like people don't champion this like it's a civil rights group. The way that homosexuality is championed like it's a civil rights group, like almost like it's a racial class. Um, I think that that just creates a lot of confusion for people. So are you saying that the people that say that they're a Christian, but they go to church, they go to church and everything, say they're a Christian, but they're acting on their gay desires, which are you saying that they are like not going to go to heaven? So I, I here's why I have a hard time with this question is because we all have sins that we still act on even as Christians. So there's there's some there's some Christian who struggles with homosexuality and they're still saved and they just have a, a serious sin issue they're struggling with, like you and me do, I'm sure. But but at some point, I mean, let me read this. I'll read the text to you. This is First Corinthians six nine through eleven. Let me just read, and, and notice there's a laundry list of a bunch of people here. We're not just highlighting homosexuality, but this is what we're being asked about. Uh, Paul writes, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Just the unrighteous, just people who are just generally unrighteous. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Notice the way they translate it is practice, because they're not talking about identity, they're talking about behaviors. Nor thieves, nor the greedy nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, and such were some of you. Like you, many of you in the congregation, you, this was you. You did all this stuff in your past, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. So there's a sense in which I want to say, I acknowledge that as, as a, a, a human, even a saved Christian, I'm still going to struggle with regular temptations daily. And I'm going to fail at times. So I don't want to say, oh, if you, but if you fail in gay ways, you're not saved. I'm like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Because then, then that, that means I'm not saved because I fail in other ways that are on this list. <laughs> so, 
so there's some sense in which this is about lifestyle, like I'm committed to the ongoing lifestyle of sin. And that may be an indicator that a person's commitment to Christ is not genuine. And that's how I look at it. Like a lifestyle of ongoing sin, it's not like you sin so much you can't be saved. It's rather your lifestyle is a symptom that shows that there may not be a genuine commitment to Christ. And it's something that's hard for all of us because I look at my own life and, and you got to go, is my lifestyle showing those symptoms? And I, I don't know always how to, I don't know always how to help people through that struggle. I kind of want to say, we have to struggle with this because it's that big of an issue. Where is my, where's my heart really with God, with, with salvation, with Jesus? Yeah. We've also had people going off of that, ask us like, if they have the homosexual tendencies of like wanting to be with the same sex, then they say, why do you deserve to like have love and have someone to show your affection to, but I can't just because mine isn't like yours or something like that. What would you say yeah. to that question? Um, there are some people who, I'm going to use an analogy here. I'm not comparing the two things. I'm just using an analogy. So homosexuality is not like pedophilia. These are very different categories, but let me, give an example of the principle, analyzing the principle. Is it, is it, does it justify what I want to do if it's the only thing I want to do? <laughs> That's all we're really saying. So I don't want opposite sex relations. I only want same sex relations. Is that enough to make me sort of like I'm being victimized by this? It's unfair um, that I can't have what you have kind of thing. But what, what about someone who the only thing they want is, is children. And you're like, okay, we all agree still not okay. I'm sorry, you, you got that struggle. This is the depravity of man. We got issues. What about someone who the only thing they want, the only person they've ever wanted is married to somebody else? And like, they're just not even interested in anybody else. They're not, nobody's even on their radar. And they're like, it's not fair that you get to have your husband and I'm over here. And the only person I, I want is that person's husband. I, I would just say, um, this is a way of recasting my temptations as if like I'm the I'm the victim of of my situation and I'm being kept from love, like this is this is just a way of turning me into a victim so that I can then have a case for why I should be able to do what I want to do. So teenagers get really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair, you know. And I I acknowledge it, but we just got to deal with facts. Like I'm a human. I'm a broken human. Humans are messed up. Like. If you're a human, you should know this about us. <laughs> we're we're messed up in lots of ways. God's guiding us in his truth and his real design for us. And being being single isn't the worst thing in the world. Okay? It's not like this is hell, just being single and not not being with somebody. No, you can live a fulfilling and wonderful life as a single person. Many people do. We just we just can't find these I'm a victim excuses for doing things that are morally wrong. And um I don't really know what else to tell somebody on that. I don't know if I would change their mind, to be honest. I, I think that it just comes down to whether we're willing to submit to what God's saying or not. Mm. Yeah, and kind of on that topic, what you were talking about, not these certain people not inheriting the kingdom of God, um, how do you how do you deal with that in your own life? And uh, like I've had that question before, like, okay, there's this line of, um, you know, being saved from like a ongoing ha habitual sin versus like sinning every once in a while. How, Cause you know, he says, it says like, you know, drunkards, swindlers, sexually immoral, those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when are you classified as a, an idolater? Like, do you just do it once or do you do it five times a day or do you do it? You know, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, I don't think it's super strict to be completely honest. So even in even in First Corinthians, the, the the passage I read was First Corinthians. So Paul talks about them, and um, okay, if you take First and Second Corinthians together, I'm just going to give you my summary of all this because it would be like a whole Bible study to go through it all. But but here's the basic thought I have on it, for what it's worth. Paul name, names several of those same issues that are in First Corinthians six nine through eleven that I just read as things that they're dealing with in their church. Um. He then goes on to just throw this out like a general warning. Like, if this is your lifestyle, you know that these kinds of people aren't saved. And I think it's just meant to hang there as like a scary moment for them. He later goes on to say things like, I hope you're not disqualified. I hope, I'll put it in my own terms, I hope that this isn't true about you. 
Like I'm seeing sins in your community. Like your church has got major sins going on. I hope that doesn't mean you're not Christians. And it seems like Paul himself didn't know how to answer this question with these guys. And I think that that's what happens. So if you have a Christian who's um, ongoing lifestyle of practicing sin, I don't know for sure they're not saved. I just don't know that they are. Like they're in this gray area to me where I can't have confidence about them. So I'm scared. And I think they should be scared too. I think they should repent and they should get right with the Lord. Now, when it comes to like applying it into your life, like, but is that me? I think you, you have to, you're, you're evaluating your life. You have to just look at your life and say, do I have real faith in Jesus? Like, do I really believe Christianity? Okay. I affirm the doctrines of, of Christianity. I really trust in him personally. Okay. I do. Have I seen my life changed? Like the work of the Holy Spirit? Okay. That's confirmatory. This is like. Yeah. Am I on the path of sanctification? And if your answer is yes, then I think you should feel comfortable and confident in your salvation. You're still going to struggle with sin every day because you're you. <laughs> That's just how it's going to be. And I'm me. Um, so I struggle with sin doesn't mean I'm not saved, but I'm living a lifestyle of it. I'm given over to it. I'm unrepentant about it. My attitude is just embracing it. Yeah, that's different. But the person who's beating themselves up, oh man, I'm so messed up. Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't question their salvation. I just think that they're they need to get help. You know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, cool. cool. So I I got a lot of questions about this because I feel like <laughs> we get asked about this all the time. And now I'm going off the script. But so earlier when we were talking about divorce, you were saying that if you messed up your original marriage and you got remarried and like that was wrong, but now you need to honor your marriage like a new thing. So say someone is watching this and they are in a gay marriage right now. Like, do you think they should get divorced or do you think that they should honor their marriage? Yeah. Um, so I, the, I would honestly, this is, this is the thing where it feels crass because I'm, I'm touching on something that's so sacred and important to somebody and I'm talking about them in the third person. I don't even know their name. I'd rather sit down with them and give them counsel and be their friend and talk to them through these, through these issues. My, my answer to this though is I don't think they should be married. I think they should get divorced, not because I support divorce, but because it's not truly biblical marriage like this we're calling this marriage we're saying it's marriage but it's not so to get divorced is to stop telling a lie about this relationship that that's my perspective on this is i'm not saying it's not a relationship i'm not saying it's not real and catch this and this is where i anger some christians because i don't think they understand what i'm saying i'm not saying you don't even love each other i'm not saying that you guys don't have incredible benefits in your relationship where you're like i have i love them and i i get so many personal benefits in our relationship what I'm saying is that all the goodness that you're feeling there is mixed in with with about the nature of the relationship, right? That that if this is not healthy, this is not right. So if you had um, to give another parallel that I'll say is not it's not the same thing. I admit that. But if you had a father who's who's with his daughter sexually, and they're they're like they want to get married, and the daughter and the dad, they seem like they get tons of really good benefits out of the relationship. Like you watch them together and you go, it's weird. It's like they have a really healthy relationship, except that it's father daughter. Like you would say all those healthy, all those nice things that you guys are experiencing. They're just part of the, the, the tangled mess that happens when we involve sin in the middle of our relationships. So yeah, I think get divorced because it's not a real marriage. St stop it because the nature of the relationship is not is not right. But the, the, the compassion and the love, the non-sexual connections that you guys have, those are not bad things. Those are just friendship taken into a, a place where it doesn't belong. So uh, there, if I haven't made everybody mad, then uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've made a lot of people uh, mad in this video so far. But yeah, um, but that, that's what I think. I think is the right perspective. It's okay. You got you got to be okay uh, with that in this in this line of work. Um, so did, I'm not sure how many videos of ours that you watched beforehand, or how, if you, or like which ones you watched. But I thought kind of a fun question was based on what you had seen about us, or like you know certain videos that we created. Uh, I would love to hear as honest as you're willing to get just kind of your thoughts, your judgments, like, you know, like, wow, these guys are doing a good thing or hmm, they might want to be careful on that. Or, you know, I'm just really curious your, your uh, perspective of oh, us. Man, if I knew this was coming, I would have watched more of your content. <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but I only, I only caught, like when you first contacted me, like, I think it was a couple months ago, I watched 
a couple of your videos just to kind of like get an idea, you know? And I feel like you guys are very real on camera. And so it was pretty quick and easy to get a vibe for you. And so I just was like, okay, they seem like they're not like trying to trick me or something like that. Like some people want to interview me and it's, it really is an elaborate trick. And I'm, I, I'm like not interested in that. So I, that was pretty much my concern. I'm like, oh, let me just see. Okay. They just seem like genuine believers. Um, I could tell you were, I, I saw a video you did. It was a Q and a video and the people are asking you questions about your life and stuff. And I could tell that you were like pretty strong and opinionated, which is not an insult by the way, <laughs> I have a lot of I'm opinionated too, uh, but I could tell you, and you wore all that on your sleeve. I, I like that. I think that's a good thing. Um, I don't really have criticism story, but I didn't watch enough of your stuff to even know. Oh man, my that. ego. I was, I was hoping you were going to be like, yeah, I've watched like hours. I even knew about you guys way oh, long, way long ago before y'all even contacted me. I, I feel was hoping y'all would reach out for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Mm. Great, great. I understood that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why do we worship on Sundays when the Ten Commandments talk about the Sabbath and even Jesus kept the Sabbath? Yeah, Jesus totally kept the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments totally talks about it. And it's such a big deal in the Old Testament under the law that it was like the death penalty for violating the Sabbath. That is, if you're in Israel, God never actually gave a law for the entire world to obey the Ten Commandments or the Sabbath. And as Christians, under the law. This is actually a really clear teaching in scripture. And I know a lot of churches, maybe it's an American tradition thing. I don't know, but there's a lot of churches that really feel like we're supposed to like keep the Sabbath, but they'll talk about it like it's Sunday, but Sunday is not the Sabbath anyway. So they're, they're keeping the, the, the next day or the first day of the week instead of the last day of the week. But it, it ends up being about going to church and not just not working. And it just gets confusing, but let me read some scripture to you that I think talks about this. Um, and it has to do with our, our relationship to the law of Moses. So the Ten Commandments, it didn't, it's not existed for all time. It was given to Moses, to the people of Israel as they're leaving Egypt and they're starting a new nation. So it's very much about national Israel, about God's work and his, his covenant with them. It's the law of Moses is one giant unit. And I'm suggesting that whole thing, we're not under it. Which doesn't mean we live sinful lives and don't, it just means we're not under this. This is not our rule set. So Galatians 3 verses 24 and 25, it says, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. Or another word translators, translations use there is tutor. Like a, a, I used to teach guitar lessons to people and I'm teaching them guitar. But once they get to a certain point, they don't need me anymore. That's the law. The law is like, hey, I'm going to show you through Israel. I'm going to show you guys the how bad sin is and how broken people are. But after Christ comes and he fulfills all of that, the symbolism and the pictures and the ceremonies, you're not under that anymore. Now you're under what the New Testament calls the law of Christ, which has to do with really the heart of what was behind the law. So yeah, don't, uh, you know, basically love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's certain ethics we're going to keep that are going to be similar to the law, but not because they're in the law. It's because they're just moral truths about God. Uh, another verse that talks about this real specifically is Romans 14, where <clears throat> uh, Paul's dealing in Romans with people in the Christian church who some of them feel like they want to observe Sabbath or certain special feast days that are in the law and other people don't. And so he talks about those two groups and he says, and I'll quote Romans 14, five and six, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. And now, so he's describing their situation. Some of you guys are like Sabbath and some of you are like, meh, whatever, I don't care. And here's his answer. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observe it, observes it for the Lord. So it's a, it's a liberty issue. Like you want to rest on the Sabbath? Go ahead. You're going to work? Go ahead. It might be healthy to rest on a regular basis, but let's not call it a religious duty, right? I know it's healthy to rest. I've learned by not resting a lot. <laughs> that I need to rest, um, but I don't call it a religious duty. So lots of room for disagreement here. We just don't want to put a yoke upon Christians that requires them to observe a Sabbath that we're not under according to scripture. Yeah. That's interesting. Man, I, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like just when you speak, you have such a gift. I don't, and I don't know if you ever doubt this, but I just want to like affirm you that, I mean, for me at least, like when you speak, I feel like it's just like a sponge soaking in knowledge and That's i don't awesome, know what man. it is it's so interesting it's like i awkward i awkwardly appreciate it <laughs> yeah it's great uh 
Yeah, so is it, did you reset the alarm? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I actually had two questions come up during that I want to make sure we ask. I don't know if they're written down there. Uh, the first question was, so your perspective on um, tongues and speaking in tongues, uh, prophetic words, you know, uh, words of knowledge. Um, that was in here somewhere. It was, yeah. yeah. What is your opinion on that? Um, so I, I, I'm not what's called a cessationist. And that's a fancy Christian term that means someone who thinks that the the use of this the sign gifts like speaking in tongues prophecy word of wisdom word of knowledge like uh, miracles that generally speaking those things have stopped like God's not really doing that anymore I'm not in that camp I I think that scripture ha in the New Testament it, it it initiates all these things happening in the church including tongues prophecy and then it never seems to stop it never talks about it stopping I think that there's no biblical case for that personally so. I would call myself like um, cautiously charismatic in that sense. Like I'm open to those things. I want, in fact, I feel like we should be asking God for prophecy. I feel like I should be asking God to speak to me. But here's my, here's where the, I hit the brakes, right? I have seen people so often misconstrue their heart's desire for the word of the Lord. Like it happens all the time. I've so many times, or someone, I mean, I don't know if you guys ever had someone tell you like, you're the one, we're going to get married. Like I've had that. My wife never did that to me, but other girls did that to me. And I'm like, I think he would have told me too if that was the case, you know. And it was just that our heart's desires, sometimes we, we want it so bad, we just think it must be God. And so that's a scary thing that we can fall into. Um, on the other hand, what if God's speaking to you and you're thinking, nah, 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 but God's trying to show you something. And I've had times where like starting my YouTube ministry, I, I felt like it was something the Lord laid upon my heart. And if I had just disregarded that, I don't know, would would it have ever happened? So I think that's important. Um, I, I believe in speaking in tongues, but but I also think there's a lot of abuses in that camp. So I kind of like hit that middle ground personally, where I want to be open, and but I want to test all things to hold fast to what is good. And I want to do it according to the, to the, to the rules in scripture about how these things are supposed to function in the church. Uh, I ask, go ahead and ask a follow-up question if you have one on that, yeah. Did you have one? You told me it too. Oh, well, yeah. Follow-up question on this uh, topic is, so have you personally ever spoken in tongues? Have you felt like you have experienced any of the spiritual gifts? Uh, let me let me tell you this. You're one of the only people who's asked me this out of a genuine, like, I just want to know. I'm curious. Usually, I get this question from basically strange spiritual people who who um who i say hey your your theology's got problems and they go do you even speak in tongues mike and in some circles speaking in tongues is like proof that you're really spiritual or even proof that you're a christian that's wrong like this is not biblical so i always push back against those people and i i I mean, I push back really hard. I usually try not to be aggressive, but in that case, I do. I'll say this is spiritual abuse. You're using tongues as like a a, a a rod to test people to like check and see if they're like spiritual enough for you. And this is abusive. Scripture actually says that not everyone speaks in tongues. There's like in First Corinthians, he's like, you know, do, is everyone a prophet? Is everyone an apostle? Well, obviously everyone's not an apostle. And then he goes, does everyone speak in tongues? So not everybody speaks in tongues. Okay, all that having been said, yes, I've spoken in tongues. <laughs> I just don't use it as like a pedigree. It's just, I've had those moments. And, and for me, it's not, personally, it wasn't with interpretation. It was very much a private ver, uh, experience. And it's only, it hasn't happened a whole lot, but it was very important spiritually in my life at the time. It had great spiritual benefits for me. So yeah, it has happened to me, but but I would never look down upon a Christian who hasn't had that experience because even scripture says not everybody will. Yeah, 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 really, I agree with you wholeheartedly there about how people test the waters with the, that question. That uh, That's not at all what I was doing, but I was no, just I, I work, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's really uh, fascinating. I, I too have had a, a, an experience where I felt like I was just overwhelmed with God's presence that I started speaking in tongues, and I was actually very close. I didn't really believe it was going to happen, um, and I've always been really skeptical of it, and I just kind of became overwhelmed with it. And I, I, I've only had that experience one time. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting topic for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Man, I really want to see more of the gifts of the Spirit in the church. I, I just, it's just that a lot of the groups that are practicing it a whole lot, I, I look at and I go, 
I don't know about that, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I God, have been God to a us. service before. They said that, uh, yeah, if, you don't, if you're not speaking in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. They said it in the yeah. service there. And uh, yeah. that just felt so, like, wrong. I, I think it's spiritual abuse. I think it's really horrible spiritual abuse to say that to people. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, oh, yeah, so the other question I had was as far as, so we're business owners. I'm assuming you probably are to some degree. Um, when it comes to tithing and, uh, like, giving money as a business owner, do you hold yourself to any kind of tithing percentages? Like, I must give... 10% or I feel like I should give 10%. Should I give 10% of my profits or 10% of my gross revenue? I, I think that's an interesting topic for me as a business owner for sure. And I'm, I would think other people who are in similar boat might find that question interesting. Okay, so on a personal level, um, we've always given like 10% plus. So like 10% is kind of like where we start our giving at. And then in addition to that, we just give whenever we want to whatever we want to support. And... Um, I want to say this though, biblically, there is no percentage given. So again, this is this is again like the Sabbath issue. It's where the Old Testament law did have Israel giving 10%. Um, that's true. The New Testament does not mandate this for believers. And I've, I, I, mean, I will hammer on this because it's just, it's where a lot of teachers who otherwise are great Bible teachers, they suddenly start taking verses out of context on this one issue. And it's not just because of greed. I think it's just tradition. I think traditionally like look at me i'm giving 10 percent. yet i'm telling you you don't have to <laughs> like, i just have a tradition that i've just i've always since i was a teenager getting my two dollars allowance right and i i'd, I'd give my you know two dollars a day it was for lunch <laughs> allowance not two dollars like a month <laughs> i'm like can i have some more soon but um but i would give my my tithe on that you know so i think that's healthy i think it's good but scripture, I would say it doesn't require 10% and it doesn't limit to 10% either. It just says that God wants us to be cheerful givers. It never mandates how much Christians should give. It it sort of implies giving based upon like your ability to give. Like that's kind of implied in various places that you're giving based upon how much you can give. And that's interesting to me that, that, that that's in there. Generally speaking, if, if somebody comes to church and they're, and they're very poor, I, 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 I would expect them to give much less, right? I also think that scripture doesn't limit our giving to our local fellowship. It does include supporting those who are ministering to us spiritually, but it talks about us caring for the poor. And I don't have to always do that through my local church. Like I could just just go take care of somebody. I could just go help somebody. I could just give them money. I could loan them money and, and then forget about it. You know, I could do whatever it is that I, that needs to be done there. I also think supporting missions and then supporting persecuted Christians. Like I've been recently thinking about trying to find a ministry. The, the trick is finding one you trust, right? But finding a ministry that's, that reaches out and helps impoverished and persecuted Christians outside the U.S. where they need it the most. Because I feel like... I feel there's a biblical example of this in the scripture where they're they're taking money from Corinth and they're sending a basically a care package of financial resources to Jerusalem where they're poor and persecuted Christians. You know, and I, I think that's a good example for us. So I think we should be very generous people. I just will not per, put a percentage on it. And our goal is to give cheerfully and joyfully and not limit the giving to the local fellowship. Um, so yeah, I, I want to support my local church. I, I don't think the church owns 10% of your income. I think that's a, a, a crass and it's not the right way to look at it. But if you want to give 10% to your church, that's fantastic. You know, do it cheerfully. Give and it do, do you feel like there's any scripture to support the idea that the more you give, the more you will receive? Or uh, I know that's, you know, not where we should be coming from. But yes. is there, do you feel like there's, uh, you know, a Yeah, there's a verse I have for you guys here. And let me read it. Yeah. Let me see if I can find it real quick. You have to hold me back. I just can't stop. I can't stop with the question. He's probably over there scrolling through his stuff. Like, oh my God, he's <laughs> catching me off guard. Okay, this is a text of scripture that I think people would quote. That I love doing this. Take an actual passage, read through it. This is something people would quote to say, if you give, then God's going to like financially bless you. Like keep, keep in mind it's financially bless you. And this is where I'm going to have some questions about that. Uh, I'm going to push back. And the question we're going to ask is, what exactly is, okay, I sow... That's me giving. That's like I'm planting seeds. I'm giving money financially. Um, what is it that I'm reaping? Is it more money? Is that what scripture says? Or is scripture saying something else? So let me read this passage to us. 
the point is this, I'm reading to the, from the ESV, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Just so you know, that's the, you can't give under compulsion. So churches can't be going, where's your 10%, right? There's no compulsion in the in the giving of Christians. It's, it's all out of the love and generosity of your heart. Um, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. That's the key there is abounding in good works, not abounding in finances. As it is written, he's distributed freely. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of. Now, before I finish that sentence, God's going to. God's going to provide what you what you have. He he's he, all the money I have he gave me. And then I'm going to sow it and then I'm going to harvest what? What am I going to harvest? Is it more money? Let me read it again. Full sentence. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Wait. So wait, when I give, the benefit is my godly character? Yeah. That's it. That's your that's your big benefit is your godly character. The idea that I'll always get money if I give money, if you really believe this, then there is giving. It's just a financial investment. Whenever I give, I'm just, I'm going to get more back. I think that there's an element of giving where you, you give and you just trust God to take care of your needs. But to realize that in the text here, like what God provides is the initial money you already have. As you give, as you're generous with it, what you get back is the harvest of righteousness or basically your godly character, you're obeying Jesus, you're, you're giving, you're uh, serving God with good works in your life and it's blessing others and, and that is more important than the money. So I think that that's the biblical teaching there is God's supply is before you give, not a windfall of extra cash after you give. So you may actually give and have less money as a result Math still so functions fun. for Christians. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting about the 10%. I've always heard my whole life, you know, like, give 10%, give 10%. And that's not really not even a rule. <laughs> yeah, it just seems yeah. like the more and more I learn about, you know, Christianity and what Jesus, the kind of lives he intended for us, it just seems like it's all focused on the heart. Like, you know, not kind of doing away with rules, but more so just he wants your heart. Yeah. Yeah. And I still give 10% as like a starting point of giving because maybe it's just habit. Nothing wrong with that. Like any Christian that takes, I don't have to give 10% and then they think, I don't have to give at all. Like, I mean, most Christians who think they have to give 10% don't anyways. <laughs> like there's an issue going on there anyhow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the heart. Stop. The first question that people asked was, how did Satan have the ability to sin before the fall? They wanted a good answer to how sin came to exist. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, let me just say this, that sin appears to have two origin stories uh, in scripture. Like Adam is talked about, like he's the beginning of the sin of man, you know? And, and when we talk about this sin in the world of mankind, it's, it's Adam. But when you look at the garden story, you're like, wait, the serpent is deceiving Eve before they actually commit the sin. So the serpent is sinning originally. And then Jesus says he's the father of lies. That's like a really interesting phrase Jesus uses about Satan. He's the father of lies, which implies that not only is he sinning before Adam and Eve here, but he's the first liar. He's the first one to tell lies. Now, if you take, I this is a lot of detail, but if you take Isaiah 14, as I do, to, to be talking about Satan, where he's like, I will ascend and I will be like God. I will be like the most high. And it has all these phrases that I think is referring to Satan and people disagree on that, but that's my opinion. So if you take it that way, then it implies that before he lied in the garden, he was lying to himself. That there was these these lies about about himself, about his ego and his glory. He was he was also called um, the anointed cherub that covers. So it seems as though Satan is like very close to God, like he's one of those angels around the throne that's very near to God. And okay, that that all just talking about the origin of of his sin, but but how? Right? How did he have the ability? I get that's a tough question. Um, the short, simple answer is well, he just had free will and he made a choice, and we could either look for a cause external to Satan, like something happened to him that made him sin, or we can look for a cause internal where it was like, he just chose it. And 
I think that's just what happened. I think he just simply chose to sin. I think angels have the ability to make choices like we do. It's a little different than us because we, we, after Adam, we're like born in the fall. Like we're born and we live and exist in the fall with sin and with issues. But with angels, it's like they're in glory. And then when they make a choice to turn from Christ, to turn from God, that choice is a different one than ours. And it seems like it has permanent final consequences. Like there isn't a redemption or a, a transformation that's going to happen later. So yeah, um, the short answer is it was he just had free will. He had free will and he made that choice. And, and that's something we also have. We just have it from a different perspective. We're in the gore and he was in the glory you know yeah <laughs> very interesting yeah i've never i've never heard that perspective before but i love it. I love it i've never even thought about that before like how satan was the first one to sin you know everyone always thinks it's adam and eve but really it was him yeah yeah okay next question why should we pray for unbelievers to be saved when god has already or when god already has his elect chosen <clears throat> all right so yeah, should we pray for unbelievers to be saved when God's already chosen his elect? And I'm going to acknowledge that this this answer I'm going to give you will not be acceptable to some people because it's hard to understand. It's hard to comprehend. And if, if you disagree with my answer here, that's okay. I will give you a second response if you disagree. <laughs> that's, that's how I'm going to handle this. But I'm going to suggest that God's election, his choosing of us, it depends on something called foreknowledge. That is God knowing ahead of time who is going to choose him. So... I chose my wife when we got married, but I, I, I knew her very well. I knew she was going to say yes. Like I, there was no fear that she would turn me down when I proposed. Uh, I already knew that the answer was going to be yes, but I still chose her. Now imagine if I had known that from eternity past. Okay. I, I would have been, I would have been choosing her long before she was even existing yet. It, she still had a real decision to make to accept my proposal. And so it's the same kind of thing with God. God's election includes foreknowledge. This is when scripture says we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Um, now, some people aren't going to like that answer. Like Calvinists are going to push back on that answer because they're going to define foreknowledge differently. But I, I think that they're mistaken on that. So I don't have to go down that road. So God knows what we do. This is a simple principle, but that doesn't mean that we had to do that. Just because he knows what you'll do doesn't mean you have to do that. My wife knows I will get up and make a cup of coffee in the morning. That doesn't mean I have no choice about the issue. And God knows, but we still have a choice. I'd also say this, that in scripture, this is great. Because even if you don't understand any of this stuff, even if you're like, you know, that's kind of weird and complex ideas. I know this. In scripture, we are given examples of praying for the unsaved. And that it might affect them and impact them. That they might come to Christ. This doesn't mean they don't make a choice, but there's things that do happen. So in Romans 10, 1, Paul's talking about the Israelites who've rejected Jesus. And he says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. So he's ongoing. His ongoing prayer to God is for their salvation, even though he knows they have very hard hearts right now, this particular group, right? So he's praying that God would just like do stuff like, Lord, you know what's going on in their lives. I just pray that they come to you. Also, um, Jesus, he counseled us in Matthew 9. Verses 37 and 38, he told us to pray for workers to be sent into the harvest field. So one of the ways we can pray for those who don't know Christ is we can pray God send them somebody to preach to them. I do this with my own family sometimes because I feel like they won't, like family sometimes won't hear you. Like they just, you're too familiar. It's too easy to dismiss some of your opinions and thoughts. And so I pray, Lord, send somebody else, send somebody else. And I did this with my own dad who was, uh, me and him have a long story of a broken relationship in the past. And now we're, now we're good. <laughs> now we're, now we're actually friends, which is beautiful and a big work of God. But in the past, he was very uh, resistant to the whole idea of God. And I remember just praying, well, he won't listen to me. I can't reach him. I can't talk to him about these things. He literally just gives me the silent treatment. <laughs> and so I just prayed and I find out like a few years later that he started riding with Bikers for Christ, this like motorcycle organization, Bikers for Christ. And his, his like best buddy is like a sold out Christian. And I'm, and I'm sitting there going like, he's answering my prayers, just sending others to someone I am having a hard time reaching. And then the third way we can pray for people is to just ask that God would keep a door open for the word of God to be declared to them. So this is in Colossians 4, 3 where it says, pray that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. And may I say, like, that's YouTube. <laughs> this, is, this is a massive open door to tell people about the truth of Christianity, at least for now. And some are worried about persecution. And I'm just like, dude, the door's open right now. Let's like walk through it and, and proclaim the truth. So these are things we can, we can pray for, for the unsaved. You know, that God would just do a work in their life to save them, that he'd send people to save them, that he'd open doors for the gospel to go out. And... 
my last encouragement is as Christians, beware attacks on your personal prayer life. These are very common. It's very easy to get discouraged. Don't let uncertainty and confusion stop you from praying to God. This is, this is so valuable and so important. So if I, I'm going to try to summarize your perspective on that question, you can tell me if I'm right. So are you basically saying that you think uh, by elect, it means like God know, knew that we, your, his, his elect was going to accept him or believe in him, but he didn't necessarily force it down their throat? Kind of. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely think so. Okay. Yeah. And then as far as like, uh, God moving on our behalf, do you feel like like prayer moves God in that sense? Like say someone is like destined or maybe they weren't going to believe in Jesus, uh, but if we we pray, we pray God might answer that prayer and then open their heart to now yeah. accepting him? Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> like imagine, here's the situation, like you look at your day and you're going, Lord, you know whether I'm going to go to work or not. You know whether I'm going to pay my bills or not. Like, I'm just going to stay in bed and not do any of that stuff. But you are an agent that's causing those things to happen now. And you're just kind of blaming it on God, right? So I think we need to take action. We need to act like the things that we do really matter in life and not think of ways to cheese out on our spiritual responsibilities. So that, because we're like, what's the point anyways? What's the point anyways? I'm going to go play video games. Like, I don't think that that's the attitude I want to have. Like, I think that our actions really change the world and really change people's lives and our prayers are really heard and God really acts. And I think God wants us to have that attitude as well. Was there any other, anything that we wanted to ask for sure? No, I mean, we didn't, we didn't finish them all, but yeah. you answered the ones you answered really great. So we're thankful that you took all the time to be here and do this with us. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, th honestly, thank you, you guys, because I'm excited that what you're doing is you're taking your what a lot of people are going to look at is just purely uh, a money making like thing to be on YouTube and be doing what you're doing. And you want to use it to impact people's lives. Like you, you're not really getting, a, I think, a reward for uh, bringing me on to talk about a bunch of controversial <laughs> stuff <laughs> and, and say things that will probably possibly get all of us in trouble. And, um, you know, with people who want to misconstrue it. So I'm just I'm grateful that you're out there doing that. I, I'm a big fan of Christians who are just doing whatever it is they do best online, just wearing their Christianity right on their sleeve. I think that's so powerful. I think it's so wonderful. You're just, I'm, a, I'm not ashamed. Like, I'm just not ashamed. What am I going to do? This, this is, this is a, the beautiful truth, and I want everybody to know it. And uh, you don't have to be a pastor or something like that. It's just, I just love just real Christians just being real online. So in that sense, I'm stoked that you guys are doing what you're doing. All right, guys. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. Uh, so grateful for Mike coming on. And definitely go check out his channel. It's called The Bible Thinker. Is that? Well, my YouTube channel is called Mike Winger. Um, and my website's BibleThinker.org. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I have you saved in my subscriptions. I get the little notification bell every time, so I don't have to search your channel. <laughs> uh, but cool. Uh, that was awesome. I know I got so much value out of that. Right? Oh, that yeah. A, that was a good one. Yeah, All it was right. fun talking to you. We're always listening to you, so it's fun to, like, be talking to you. Yeah, well, it's it's my privilege and just joy to get to see your guys' faces and talk to you and stuff. And Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. thanks for being here. This is Nathan Sutton and Mike Winger, sowing seeds of truth, <laughs> love, and inspiration one view at a time. And that was our Q&A with Mike. <laughs> <laughs>